Association. I wanted to welcome you all here tonight um, and say thanks for coming. Um, I have a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm going to hand it off to David to get this party started. So we um, are conducting our first set of Children's Media Association elections. Um, all of our members should have gotten an email with a link today and then gotten a new email with a new link today. <laughs> So for that second email, um, even if you do it this evening before you leave, I would love for all of our members to weigh in on um, our next team of leadership uh, to bring CMA into 2014 and beyond. Um, and also, we are starting our Donate Now campaign. Um, if you have an inkling to give back to this group and allow us to do more events like this and sort of expand our website, um, there's a button on our, on our website where a tax-deductible donation can be made. Um, and I would love to see all of you at our holiday party on December 2nd at Hurley's. Um, there's information on our website. It's going to be epic, as it always is, so I encourage you all to come. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce David, who someone said really doesn't need an introduction, and I somewhat agree. I was joking with Allison and Paul that whenever David has an idea, you say yes before you even need to hear it. And so that's sort of what has brought us all here tonight. Um, he'll tell you what you're all doing later, I'm sure. <laughs> But with that, I would love to hand this over to David to introduce uh, our family. Thanks. That's probably, that's probably the most dangerous piece of information I've ever gotten, that people should say yes to something before I even tell them what it is. I, I, can, I can use that. Um, I'm David Kleeman, and I am recently arrived in New York uh, as... <laughs> As uh, Senior Vice President of Insights Programs and Play Evangelist, it really is on the cards, for uh, Play Collective, a research strategy and business development company located uh, here in Manhattan. We also have Washington office, and our global head of research is in Western France, so we are truly a global company. Um, all of our work is centered around kids, families, and play, um, the ways that uh, family, kids and families interact with each other, <coughs> with their environments, with their communities, um, all of that. And we, love to, uh, to work with, with you. As a play evangelist, I have something of a, a unique role that, that uh, I'm doing some work with some of our clients, obviously, but also my role is to take what we're learning through our research, to take what we're learning through other people's research, to look around the world at, at what's going on in, in the news, in trends, and as I've done for 25 years, to look all around the world for exceptional children's media and children examples of, of uh, what people are doing for and with, with children, and turn that into things that face back outward from the company, whether it's meetings like this, whether it's uh, small conferences, uh, screenings, all kinds of events, but also I'll be doing a lot of writing, I'll be speaking at other people's conferences. So I'm really looking forward to, to that kind of engagement with the community of, of people who work with children and work with families uh, in a lot of different ways in, in this new role. Uh, we have a play lab as well. We, if you're doing research, we encourage you to come down and hold it at our play lab down in Lower Manhattan. Tonight's event is something I've, I've been wanting to do for quite a while because it seems like such a crucial moment for it. Um, the kids media community, but also researchers, are standing in the middle of this maelstrom that's going on around them. Um, technology changes, market changes, families are changing, uh, demographics are changing, and in the middle of all this, we're realizing that we need to, industry has a, a need for a new model of research, something that's really rapid, something that's fast, that's flexible, and that gives insight into how young people are growing and, and learning and playing today. At the same time, academia is sitting back and saying, we've got great data over the years on how kids engage and interact with television in particular, to some extent with the internet. But now we've got all these new questions about the mobile environment. I was at a conference a few weeks ago where we were talking about uh, the state of research on children and me media today. And so much of what we know needs to be brought now into a context of what we know about the mobile environment. We know second screen, or not second screen, but, but passive viewing, that, that children, uh, uh, secondhand media is what someone was calling it, that, that having a television on in the background distracts kids from their play, distracts parents from their interactions with kids. What's the secondhand media or the <coughs> passive media of the mobile world? So there are so many questions that, that we are ready to ask, that we need to ask, and that we really need to work together to ask. We've got this great platform now for industry and, and for academia to work together. 
I am especially thrilled to be doing this evening with the Children's Media Association. I'm a proud board member of the association. Um, really excited now that I'm here in New York to be able to actually participate in the activities as opposed to just wistfully looking at the announcements <laughs> from Chicago. Um, I'm looking to all, forward to all kinds of collaborations. I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas for what we can do with, with the CMA independently. Um, I will encourage you to come to our Play Collective website and sign up for our weekly lab notes if you want to keep track of what's going on out in the world of kids and families and also with Play Collective. Uh, where, I, where I am today. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator tonight, who also just happens to be Play, Play Collective CEO. Uh, she's someone who has lived her entire career in that space, uh, on the academic side, the industry side, back and forth, and, and walking the, the sort of fence between them and bringing them all together. With that, Allison Bryant. Thank you, David. I'm glad to know that I'm supposed to just be saying yes to, to everything you come up with. I'm a little bit scared about this precedent being set. I'm not sure that's a really great idea. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the format for this evening. I'm really excited about what um, David and the CMA folks have been putting together. Um, so I will introduce shortly our quiz master, Stephen, for the night. So this is going to be very fun and interactive. You know, we always want to play, right? Um, so I'll introduce him in a minute, but I also want to start off by introducing um, these people who are up here so you know why they're here, right? Um, we have, honestly, one of the most amazing panels and combinations of people that I've been honored to be with, so I'm really excited about the group we have tonight. Um, we did not give them sort of buzzers in the family feud style thing, but I really pushed for it, right? <laughs> um, so what we have is, over here on your left, we have our academics. Um, and I use that term loosely, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, and I said I wasn't sure which side I should be sitting on. Um, and on this side, we have our industry folks. And so what we're going to be doing is after, um, Stephen's going to be having our quizzing uh, between a couple of different sort of panel sessions that we're going to have some dialogue, some really targeted dialogue between our academics and our industry folks. So let me just very briefly introduce who we have up here. Um, they're going to be talking a little bit more later on, so if they want to give more color around, around that or tell you that I said something wrong, they can do that later. They will not interrupt me right now, though. <laughs> um, that's the industry side of me. You will not. Um, no. Uh, so right next to me, we have Fran Blumberg. Fran's an associate professor in the Division of Psychological and Educational Services at Fordham in their Graduate School of Education. And she has a forthcoming book. This will tell you a lot about what she's got going on. Um, uh, Learning by Playing, Frontiers of Video Gaming and Education. You know I like that title of that book. Well done. <laughs> um, next to her, we have Renee Churro O'Leary, who is the president of education in the 21st century. Um, Renee is also someone who's done quite a bit of spanning between industry and academia, but tonight she's an academic, so oh, yeah. just I keep... going to jump over there. Right? Yeah, no, you've got to sit over here on the <laughs> academic side tonight. Um, but Renee, like I said, she's also spanned. She has taught at Teachers College Columbia. She's been a visiting scholar at Harvard. So she's definitely been in it on the academic side and brings that to the work she does with the industry. And then we have Vicki Katz, who went to grad school with me. She is so lucky. Um, a really great mentor to her at USC. Um, oh, but about her. Right, 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 right. Yeah, but right, but about her. No, so Vicki's an assistant professor at the School of Communication Information at Rutgers. So she's relatively close by here in New York. Um, and she also has a new book coming out, which will tell you a lot about what she's doing. Uh, Kids in the Middle, How Children of Immigrants Negotiate Community Interactions for Their Family. Um, so a lot of sort of broad perspective on kids um, and one of the largest growing populations that we have. So anyone who's working in kids and media knows that this is a, a big deal to pay attention to. And then on the other side, we have um, Sean McAvoy, who also has been mentored by me um, part of it. Um, Sean is recently back at Nickelodeon, now as vice president of uh, game production for Nick Digital. Um, Sean's got a great background because he's done the big company media side, but he's also done the startup side um, and lived through it and to tell it. Um, and he was at Fungo Play, which was a, is a really innovative group who's working on trying to bring physical activity and interactivity together in that space. So we sort of done both sides of that. We have Bob Higgins, who's um, the executive vice president of Fremantle, Fremantle Kids and Family Entertainment, right? Um, and Bob has had been, 
been in a lot of different places you guys probably have heard of over his career. Um, places like Wild Brain, Cartoon Network, Sony, you know, a couple of those small little, you know, places she's been. Um, and then next to him we have Alice Khan. Alice is currently media social responsibility at Cartoon Network and also has been a couple places you may have heard like Sesame Workshop, PBS, Markle Foundation. Um, so again, we have a really great industry side who comes from a lot of different perspectives um, and a really great um, academic side who also brings a lot of different color to, uh, to the conversation tonight. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our quiz master for the evening. Uh, Stephen Gass, who is the president of Every Baby Company and the principal of the Gass Company. And uh, he has also straddled a little bit. He's taught at NYU in the child, uh, at the Tisch School of Arts. Um, so he's also straddled a little bit and he's going to be your quiz master for this evening. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, some of you don't know who I am. Some of you who do know me more on the creative production side of a lot of kids' media, but what probably nobody knows is I started my career on the academic side. I dropped out of graduate school, never finished my PhD because I got offered a research job at Sesame Street many moons ago. And it was at that point that my love of research sort of took form and it has sort of informed everything I've done. I'm that pain in the ass in the room that says, well, what about the research? And I'm not talking about the focus groups. I'm talking about what do we really know about what works with kids, what works with families, what they retain, what sticks. So um, with that as a little bit of context, uh, I came up with this notion, a, a game show for us. And we can uh, open this first screen. And the game show is called Data Dump. <laughs> um, yeah. That potty chair didn't it's, make that up. It that's real. Sale. It's real. <laughs> uh, so the way tonight's going to work is I've got a series of questions we're going to do two at a time. They're multiple choice, and each question uh, frames a piece of research that most people in the world have probably heard of or, or are aware of on some level. Um, what we're going to do is... Uh, if, I'm not quite sure the best way to get your responses, but we'll, we'll start with just a show of hands for what you think the right answer is. So imagine, if you will, uh, we don't have our audio tonight, but imagine, if you will, very cheesy game show music and drum rolls and occasional audience applause. So with that, can we start with just a little bit of applause to get the first question started? Excellent. All right. Let's do number one, the Mozart effect. How many people have heard of the Mozart effect? Perfect. All right. So the Mozart effect refers to a study which reports A, babies who listen to Mozart become better math students, B, kids aged 0 to 3 who listen to Mozart have higher IQs than those who don't, kids aged 3 to 6 who listen to classical music develop larger vocabularies, D, college students who listen to Mozart are better at mental origami games, or B, classical musical listeners. Classical music listeners spend less money on iTunes. So, show of hands for A, B, okay, C, D, E. All right, uh, and can we reveal the, the, the answer, please? Fascinating. The Mozart effect, a piece of research that spawned a billion dollars of product, a lot of it you know, around the baby Mozart kind of stuff. And even today, I saw on a, uh, a billboard advertising a new tablet. I think, it, it was, I think it's Apple, but it might be Samsung. But in any event, the tagline is, Mom, I need something better than a toy. And the kid is touching a page with a picture of Mozart. <laughs> Unbelievable. The study was done with college students who listened to the Mozart for about 10 or 15, about 10 or 15 minutes before, they then took subtests, subtests of the Stanford Binet uh, intelligence test, and these particular subtests were things where they would look at a piece of paper and have to imagine what it would look like folded up. So that's what the Mozart effect is about. So as long as we're in it, let's go a little deeper. Question number two. About the Mozart effect, which of the following statements are true? The effect, meaning these college students did better on their mental origami, lasted 15 minutes. 
Zell Miller, who was the governor of Georgia at the time, proposed spending taxpayer dollars to provide free classical CDs to all newborns in the state. <laughs> C, the results of the study have never been replicated. D, all of the above. All right, we're writing. A, the effect lasted 15 minutes. Which one of these is true? A, okay, reasonable. Uh, Governor Miller, spending taxpayer money on classical music. True? Um, the results of the study have never been replicated. Okay, or D, all of the above. Okay, I'm giving myself away. I should not be constructing test questions. <laughs> D, all of the above. I mean, what's really fascinating is uh, what did happen with the, with the, in Georgia. Sony, you know, stepped up to the plate and they actually underwrote the, uh, the music. And I think for at least a year, uh, newborns got classical CDs from, from Sony. Uh, and, you know, the really shocking thing and this is a very sticky study. This is like, what, 20, 30 years old, never been replicated. Although there was a little one, a little attempt done in the UK, and there was a rock band named, I will think, I, I, I will, I, I'll get to the name of it, but the, the rock band's music did better than the uh, Mozart. <laughs> All right, so I guess we're now gonna go to something else, but we'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So um, our first panel topic that we're going to have, which I'm going to put this out there and then we're going to start on the uh, academic side um, because that's the way I decided to do it tonight. <laughs> um, uh, the first side, what we're going to do is each person is going to respond to the question about what do you want the other field to know about your work. And they're going to take about three minutes. When I say about, I mean three minutes, academics. Um, they're going to take three <laughs> minutes to sort of synthesize what it was that they wish the other side knew about their work. Fred, you want to start? Sure. Um, from a total academic standpoint, I, I, I was listening to what David had said earlier about the industry being fast, flexible, and I'm thinking, this is not exactly academic. We're sort of <laughs> a lot more plotting, a lot more deliberate. Um, what I was thinking about that I would like the industry to heed is the sense of developmental appropriateness. What is it that is appropriate for students, for children of different ages? And I think we've got people in the audience, I know we have people in the panel who have dedicated themselves to this issue, but I think that they are the exceptions and not necessarily the rule. Especially if you look at a lot of the money that is now being given to individuals to develop educational games, to develop serious games. So one of the concerns that I have is that the games and the materials that are developed going beyond games are developmentally appropriate for all audiences for whom um, the media is intended. That's one issue. Another issue is to what extent is there scaffolding done? Is there scaffolding built into the media to ensure that whatever academic messages or whatever learning messages are introduced transfer outside the media venue? To what extent does the information that's presented in the media translate outside the media context to more formal learning situations, such as the school setting? That's another issue. I told you I'd be um, short. I will be. <laughs> another issue pertains to to what extent are individuals, and this I address primarily for the educational games, not for educational television, which I think has done a brilliant job an absolutely stunning job ensuring that viewers are engaged <coughs> with the content and want to watch the content again, want to watch the content again and again and again. <laughs> in the game setting, what we often find is that in the case of educational games, kids might be willing to play for the time that the game is introduced, if it's a grant situation for the duration of the grant, but then after the grant is over, after the funding has dissipated, this game goes on a shelf and is not played again. So to what extent can we build into different media venues this sense of wanting to revisit the information, wanting to revisit the venue? To what extent can we mimic what educational television has been doing so successfully in other media venues? 
And I think the band is Arctic Monkeys. I think that's what's going on. That's, that's it. Uh, so, true academic, I actually wrote down some things. <laughs> so, um, when I was preparing for tonight, I was had NPR on in the background, and uh, there were two actors who had just written a book being interviewed. Uh, their book is called The Disaster Artist, My Life in the Room, The Best Bad Movie Ever Made. And I haven't seen The Room, maybe some of you have, but um, supposedly it's a classic of bad movies. And what this made me think about is how a property, bad or good, can transcend a boundary and find itself in new territory or even create a new genre. It's an original and it has its own voice. So in my view, as in, on the education side, I think that educational theory practice and insight in children's programming can add a transcendent element, um, like finding clues or like opening doors into a story, only what the doors that are opening are into a child's mind. I know that for some in the industry, curriculum seems to be a formulaic process, um, but we are really looking at the essence of how children learn, and we want, and now as with brain research, we, can, we, we know ever and ever more. Um, and we're wanting children to look with wonder and excitement at learning and to also give them materials that we do with rigor. So I think there's an interesting mix between aesthetics and research, um, and that can create a new genre. So just listening to Fran, I thought, we educators speak a certain language, and just in, the, in a minute or so, what do educators actually do? Number one, Developmental appropriateness. We did not talk beforehand. <laughs> so the issue of developmental appropriateness, it's really important. At what level, at what age, and, and to whom are you speaking? Scaffolding is another word Fran used. Scaffolding and sequencing, how you build an educational idea, not just sort of salt it or ketchup it onto something, but build it and scaffold it so that it has a structure. Um, planning backwards from objectives, really working to, to have objectives. Then there's something called the teachable moment, and that's what an educational consultant does. Um, it's to go and say, at this juncture, in the creative that you're given and you're looking at, there's a moment here to show something, to teach something, and where a child could really learn if maybe we tweak it this way or that. So the making of meaning is, is, is critical. Also, I think what educators look for is background knowledge and context, so that there is some way to kind of put what is being taught, quote unquote, into the larger context, so that it, it has replicability and it has a connection. And finally, there's this great term called the zone of proximal development, which just means, it's from a theorist, Vygotsky, which just means the carrot and the stick. It means you give a child something just a little bit beyond where they might be able to go. So there's an aspirational uh, aspect to what the learning is. And that's another thing that an educator can kind of help uh, do. So I, I looked at processes of interaction between an educator and the creative team. Because there has to be, you know, it, 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 the way we're set up, it kind of looks like we're on opposite sides, but we're really not. We're really not. Because if we're working together, we're working together. Um, so I think there has to be an integrative model. Um, there has to be a clear agreement of what the show is about. And ideally, the educator should work from the time of the Bible creation. Because um, then there's an alignment of the creative vision with the education. And, uh, and to know how the characters are going to embody certain kinds of education. I think liking and respecting each other is really key. It's not enough to give notes. I work with a lot of people in LA, you know, and sometimes, and in Toronto. I've worked on shows like for three years where I never actually saw the person in the flesh. And uh, yet, we have had a rapport. And I think, so it's really important to have as much communication as possible. Dialogue, questioning, understanding the rationale for a given situation. 
Humor? Absolutely. We're working for kids. We're working on kids programming. We know education serious business, but we, 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 we've got to understand who kids are and love them. I, I, words I have here like joy and appreciation and uh, dare I call it love. I think we want to have pride in the work that we would do together. Pride that we're producing something that kids will benefit from um, and not just rushed in but scaffolded and built. And I think one of the difficulties is that sometimes there are too many cooks in the broth. It's like, or in the kitchen. <laughs> Making broth in the kitchen. Um, we, the reason I say this is, in recent years, and I'm sure you've all encountered this, there is the transmedia approach now, you know, where it's not just one medium, it's not just television, it's the game, it's the um, app, it's, it's, it's all of those pieces. But very often they're not made in the same company by the same people. They are, um, they're fragmented. And I think because there are so many platforms that hopefully as we move into the future where this is a more common phenomenon, that the educational vision uh, can be incorporated throughout those dimensions and it would make the experience a, a rather um, integrated rather than a fragmented one. And I, I will not do it now, but I have two illustrative stories. One, a really bad situation. One, a fabulous situation. So if anybody wants to know later, I'm happy to tell you. Thank you, Renee. I'll go. Thank you. So I've spent the last 10 years or so, I only look like I'm 18, um, <laughs> working with a group that, as Ali mentioned already, a lot of people in this room recognize from a demographic imperative and just in general is an increasingly important part of the segment of children that are growing up today. I look at low-income Latino families, primarily immigrant of immigrant parents, but also native-born. And so I spend a lot of time looking at how parents and kids in one or both languages learn together with different forms of technology and how that plays a role in how they understand their environments, both collectively and individually. And so whenever I talk about the work that I do, and I'm not going to, I, I can't even bore anybody with the details in three minutes, I can't manage it. Um, but whenever I give talks about this work, I'll have someone from industry come up to me and say, my God, we're trying to reach these people, and there's almost a flat panic on their faces. How are we going to get this segment? And so I started thinking about those experiences and thinking, you know, we're talking about building bridges here. If we all want to get to the same destination, academics and industry, everyone's trying to build better programming that really speaks to kids and families where they live and how they live and to create things that are meaningful and relevant and really the very best media that there can be. If we all want that destination, why is it so hard to build a bridge between where we're standing in order to get there together. And I started thinking about this and thinking, I think the crucial difference is not the goal, but where the focus is. And I think academics focus, perhaps to a fault, on process, and industry focuses on outcomes. Academics focus on process. We love, love, <laughs> to tell you everything, every contextual nuance of a family, and, there's, and I'm guilty, I'm so guilty of this, right? I want you to know everything about why, the, why it depends, why the answer is never yes or no, why it always depends. I need you to understand and appreciate the nuance, right? I need to develop detailed assessments and explanations of why there is variation across a group of people, why they are not a homogenous population and I need that to be understood, right? <laughs> and the outcomes of what I do, as a quali mainly qualitative but mixed methods researcher, the outcomes are not predetermined, they emerge. I don't know where it's going, I want to understand it on its own terms. Industry, on the other hand, wants best practices. What's the best, simplest way for me to reach this population? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> What's the bottom line? You want one sentence? I can write you a book. <laughs> What's the saleable solution? You want me to sell something to these people? I want you to understand their lives. <laughs> I want you to do the research quickly. Do you have any idea how slowly an IRB moves when you want to talk to someone?
speaking parents and their children in their homes. Give me a break. <laughs> Process and outcome. But we want the same things, right? So at the root of all, the, and this is at the root of all the other challenges we could discuss about timelines, about procedures, funding, and so forth. But I think that the different foci without thinking across is what alienates, right? Because when academics think that all industry wants is a bottom line, and something they can sell, and that's not all industry wants. And industry thinks, oh my god, they're going to write me another you know, book-length treatment of something that's going to tell me it depends. I can't bear it. <laughs> we're, not, we're speaking across each other. We've got good stuff. We've got stuff you can use. You guys want to take that stuff and do real design and product with it. We've both got learning capacities, but I think that since we want to get to the same place, just got to figure out how we focus on where we're trying, what the goal is, we can work backwards to both process and outcomes. Thank you. so much for letting me go first. <laughs> uh, so, um, but uh, Allison and David and everybody, thanks so much for, for having us tonight. Um, a couple things that I, that I heard that really stuck with me from um, the remarks that you guys uh, um, went through. The, the word appropriate, um, I think, is one thing that we're consistently focused on when we're thinking about content for kids. And it's, it's um, you know, demographically appropriate, but it's also appropriate in terms of the ability to um, work through gameplay styles. I'm talking about games specifically here. Work through gameplay styles and and have a really um, designed experience. And that brings me to another remark I heard, which was scaffolding. So I think when we're thinking about um, games for for kids and, and games that are demographically appropriate, we're more and more focused on making sure that there is a game design that undergirds that. Um, and I think that's one of the greatest areas that we can cross over because we're, I think, now seeing, uh, emerging kind of into an era where game design is a pursuit, right, an academic pursuit. And, and we have, um, more consistently than ever before, we see degreed game designers who come through and, and are, you know, great compliments to, um, to, the, to the business that we do. Uh, and then finally, um, the, the other thing that stuck with me was wonder. And because, I mean, I think to your point, we're, all of us are kind of in the business of wonder and of creating um, beautiful experiences and really believing in those experiences. Um, and I don't think that we can get there without those other comp components of what we do. Um, so I think that's really, those are the, the best ways that we can work together is to focus on, um, you know, making sure that our, our products are appropriate, that they have um, great design, uh, and that they create those moments of wonder. Um, yeah, the way that um, you can kind of tell is, except for Alex, who cheated and came in with typed words because we talked about yesterday, we're just coming in and winging this <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, be uh, prepared to listen and then wing it, except for Alex. <laughs> um, so, so a lot of what, uh, you know, my, what I'm going to say here is, is coming from what you guys just said too, because I think often that, that is how um, we do work together. You guys put some information out and then we kind of take it and gestate it and respond to it and use it or not sometimes. Um, the first thing you need to know about us, and, and I'm talking me as a programmer and producer, is I would love, and the people who do my job would love nothing more than for research to come and tell us this is what is going to work. This is what kids <laughs> like. This is how they like it. And, I mean, and just give it to us because we are all, as a you know industry, like living in fear of not finding that thing, and just panicked to make sure that we find that thing first. So you know, we in many ways we love research, and in many ways you know, as, as we're talking here, it, it sometimes um, does 
come at odds. And I think some of it is just the approach and some of the, the phrasing that, that you know, you guys had, had said was, you know, build better programming. And it's kind of like, okay, well, what does better mean? For me, it means the most kids watching at any one time. And if they get something out of it, that's awesome. But if they don't and they watch, that's what <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because that, that's what Kellogg's wants. And that's who, pays, and that's who pays the bills. Um, and then if they can, you know, uh, you know, watch it on the screen and be hugging it in a tactile format at the same time, that's pretty awesome too. Um, and uh, and then um, you know, a, a, a phrase uh, I forget which of you had said it was pride that will create something that kids will benefit from. And and then this is you know another thing. What is the benefit? Um, is the benefit ABC123? When, when Alice and I were at Cartoon Network together, we started a preschool block called Tickle You. And if you sneezed, you missed it, because it was launched and gone. Really. <laughs> but, but the whole concept was kids benefit from laughter and enjoyment and just mental you know, break from the day. Um, and, um, and so it's kind of like, okay, so what, it, what does that mean? What does, you know, ben what's the benefit? Um, and then the last thing was, you know, how to reach them, and, and when, um, you know, I forget, forget, forget exactly who said it, all of a sudden I was reminded of, of Whoopi Goldberg in Sister Act when they were talking about, you know, getting people to come to the church, and she said, church is boring. And unfortunately for kids these days, they look at something that reads and smells educational, and they know it's boring. It's like, so how do we get their butts in the seats and make it entertaining? You know, that, because at the end of the day, you could make the most wonderfully, nurturing, beneficial, and educational show in the world, and nobody comes to it. And it's like, so how do we take all that and do something? Because I'd love, you know, to leave a lasting impression other than a bunch of fart jokes on the wall. You know, that I'd, I'd like, you know, there to be, uh, you know, something to, to look back on in that way. But at the end of the day, my job is to sell tickets. Get the kids in the seats, get them there watching, get them there watching as long as possible, and then buying, you know, <clears throat> what, uh, what they've just watched. And that's, that's our challenge. Thank you, Bob. Alice. All right, so I won't read the notes <laughs> 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 um, And yeah, Bob and I did work on, you know how you love your failures more than anything else? <laughs> um, and the point of, of our preschool service really was that humor is a sign of intelligence. Um, and for anybody who's playing with a baby, you know that you're just thrilled when you've got a sock on your hand and they laugh because they know that socks don't go on hands. <laughs> so that, that's a really great joke when you're six months old. Um, I think one of the things listening to um, listening to the, the other side, I'm, just, I'm actually not quite sure that the bridge doesn't exist. Um, or else it's really like the Second Avenue subway and it will just never get <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, honestly, we've been talking about this since, since those of us who are old enough watched Big Bird Black and White. Um, this is a real, this topic has been talked about and talked about and talked about. And honestly, in listening to the academics and having worked in this industry for a very, very, very long time, um, I think the bridge does exist and I'm, all due respect to David, I, I don't think it's a question. Um, it, it, as I was thinking about the one piece I will wrote, because I really did think about it after we <laughs> talked yesterday, um, is the comparison for me was laundry. Um, I used to fold my children's laundry because I hated the like smushed way that they did it. Um, and then I realized that my folding it made it fit on the shelves in their closet, but if they wore it, it just kind of smoothed out anyway. Um, with academic research, we read a lot of research, and even though Bob says he doesn't, he does. Um, we read an enormous amount of research, whether that's child development research or when you're working on a project, you need to bring subject matter experts in and learn everything you can about it so you can talk to children about it in words of less than two syllables. There's an amazing amount of not, in, not original research, but reading of original research and reading of academic <coughs> research that goes on even in the production of the kinds of entertainment programming that the three of us do. That said, the final product is kind of like my kids' clothes. It all kind of 
mush, it's a, it, your research has been translated into another product. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually think there's this great divide. I think the divide is that we produce entertainment programming, not educational programming. If Linda Szymanski were sitting here and Sandy Wax, and, you'd have a different conversation because they have a specific purpose for the programs that they do. They want to, as Bob said, they want to teach it's either literacy or numeracy or STEM or, but my goal is to make sure that I engage children with developmentally appropriate entertainment that gets them to want to spend even more time with me than I think is a good thing. Um, so I, I, you know, our job is, is you know, Anne Wood on the home series is, said it best. Our job is to provide children with a window and a mirror. Um, and in that mirror, they should see themselves and their own dreams and their own ideas reflected. And through that window, they should see people and places and things and ideas that they haven't yet experienced. Um, and as I look at entertainment programming, it may not be the, it may not be math and science, but it's that window and it's that mirror. Stuff. We're bringing the quiz master back. Woo! <laughs> okay. Um, this next question refers to a. Can I have a slide? Oh, there it is. Uh, a 2004, what, you know, is almost a seminal study. Uh, this guy, whose name is Dimitri Kostakis, he's out of um, uh, Washington. Seattle, yeah. um, University of Washington. Uh, big report, big study that linked early TV viewing with uh, later uh, onset of ADHD. So with reference to that study, which of the following statements is false? A, this longitudinal study, that means it took place, they watched the kids as they got older, uh, was based on clinical as well as parental observations, meaning that people were looking at the kids, they were in the homes, as well as interviewing parents about their kids. B, the study was conducted as a telephone survey uh, of a random set of parents across the country. C, the study did not look at what TV content was viewed. D, the study was later refuted in the Journal of Pediatrics, the same journal in which this original study and countless headlines um, were spawned. So, uh, show of hands, which of the following statements is false? I know that's a harder question to, ask, to answer. A, the, the, the study was based on clinical and Parental observations. It was a telephone study, which is false. C, the study did not look at what content, what the kids were actually watching, and the study was refuted. Which one is false? How many for A? Okay, B, telephone survey. Uh, study did not control for content. Okay, and the study was refuted. Can we have the answer, please? Crazy man, crazy stuff. Um, this, you know, this study had parents across the country turning the television off, quaking in their boots that they were about to undo any brain cells that had been wired. Um, what's really the way it worked? They called parents when the kids were one and said, "How much TV did your kids watch?" They called them back when the kids were three. How much TV did your kids watch? Well, I mean, there was they were ostensibly gathering a journal, but. There's no way to know whether or not what they wrote down was actually valid. And then at age seven, they called and basically said, so, did your kid bouncing off the walls? <laughs> and, and, and they asked the parent to sort of, they, they gave them a, a, this uh, test that is generally done by clinicians that sometimes can help you to see whether or not you, your kid has an attention problem. The, the study was completely bogus, was refuted, uh, I think, a year and a half later. What's really fascinating about the uh, culture we live in, the fact that the study was refuted was never reported on. And this particular study, I saw a recent reference of it. And we tried. Oh, yeah, crazy. <laughs> crazy. Um, and in fact, I mean, a little piece of, an extra piece of data. When the Disney company uh, said to these guys, show us the data, give us the raw data, and we're going to reanalyze it. And I'm not making this up. The data went missing. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it was baby gay. Crazy stuff. Okay. <laughs> All right. Christakis, remember that name. I mean, to me, he sort of 
He's sort of like the Ted Cruz of kids' media research. <laughs> he can always get a headline. Um, he is passionate about what he believes in and um, just keeps sort of working with facts. Uh, okay, so Time Magazine ran the following headline. Baby Einstein's not so smart after all. And this was based on a Kisaka study that looked at TV viewing and its impact on vocabulary acquisition in very young kids. So, so here, this is like a multiple, multiple choice. So which of these are true? Um, the study tested ex through experimental manipulation whether viewing baby videos has a positive or negative impact on the vocabulary acquisition. Again, that thing, they're in the home, they're, what, they're looking at what the baby is watching, and they're counting words and that kind of business. B, um, the study indicated that the sample used was not representative of the gen general population. The study revealed a negative association between baby video viewing and language acquisition in, children's, in children aged 8 to 16 months, but that um, negative relationship was not there at 17 to 24 months. So that sort of says it was there, but it goes away. Uh, or the study said parents whose children watch a lot of baby videos are less motivated to promote children's language development. Or the study suggested that poor language development in and of itself causes greater viewing of videos. All right. Anybody want to volunteer as to which of these five actually applied to the study that got headline new, this kind of headline featured in Time Magazine? Come on. All right, so. What? CDE? Okay, let's take a look. Actually, all of them. If you look at the study that I recently reread, what is crazy is in the discussion area, there's a whole lot of damning of parents. A whole lot of damning. Well, the parents whose kids don't have uh, advanced language skills are probably freaking out, so they're putting them in front of educational videos. Makes a lot of sense. Um, the, um, the parents, um, oh, those kids with, oh yeah. So I'm a, I'm a lazy parent, I'm just gonna throw my kid in front of a video, therefore that's gonna cause for a uh, delay in their language. The fact that here's a study that showed a six to eight word vocabulary difference. We were talking about six to eight words difference at eight or nine months, which is kind of nothing. Um, and at 17 to 24 months, it, the whole thing goes away. But yeah, this is headline worthy. And this is the kind of stuff that in a very frightening way drives markets. Really scary stuff. Um, and my favorite piece of data on, uh, on this particular data, in the study itself, they say, the sample we used was not representative. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. This is invalid research, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. All right, stay tuned. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so now we're going to turn the tables a little bit. This is not, we're, everyone's not giving three minutes to a seven minute or whatever they end up being uh, talks this time. Um, instead, we're just going to open up a little more, although the industry folks are going to have the opportunity to ask the first question, whichever you guys want to. Um, and this is really about what do you want to know about the other field's work? Um, whether it's the process, right? Or it's the outcome, or it's the content, or whatever it is. What is it that you're really just curious about, about what happens on the other side? So industries, what do you guys? Okay. Um, so, I'd actually love to hear um, from each of you just one great example. Um, I know you kind of, we may have to talk about yours over one cheese, but um, <laughs> one great example of a collaboration uh, with industry um, that you can call. The greatest collaboration? Mm -hmm. One of the greatest collaborations? Sesame Street. One of the greatest collaborations ever. One of the earliest, and, and there have been several examples. And again, there are people in the audience who are part of, you know, the exemplification of psychologists, producers, 
working together, educators, to develop a product that engages, to develop a product that inspires people to rewatch, and to develop a pro product that actually extends beyond the viewing. That's my choice. When I, what Fred said, I worked at Sesame as a research director there for, for some years. And what I have to agree with is that there was something called the CTW model. It was this three circles showing the integration of creative creativity and creation of content, research, and production all working together. That was a very extraordinary model. Curriculum development happened at the very beginning of a several years' worth of work. Um, it was so extensively designed, and that's a rarity. Um, the story that I was going to tell is, I, I, I won't mention the company, but I worked as an educational advisor on a show that was on for several years. And I think the, the respect, the kind of thing where um, there's really a lot of listening and dialogue, as I mentioned before. There was one episode in which the, the, the characters are in a library. Um, and uh, there's also a blind character there who's not a regular one on, on the program with a seeing eye dog. Suddenly the lights go out in the library. And they're at, the librarian had been reading a story and was at a really critical moment. And the lights went out because there was a storm outside. And they said, oh my god, they were scared. They were, and then all of a sudden the blind child says, let me help you. And I can read this story, and I can read it in a new way, and did it through Brielle. So what was fascinating for me is that this program not only had me as a kind of literacy consultant, which was one th thread throughout the whole show, just one thread, but there were many, um, but that they hired someone who worked on issues of d disability and blindness. For example, <coughs> do not pet. The seeing eye dog. Um, they're working now. Something I never knew before. That that was, you, you know. And I thought that the respect for the detail, um, and the and and all of us working together. <coughs> when we would send notes, they were to over twenty people, and they were in Toronto, L.A., and New York, and um, and there and it was uh, a, a beautifully um, creative show, and at the same time very solidly educational I'm going to have to side with you. <laughs> I think Sesame Street does it, still does it better than just about anybody, and I've been lucky to get to work with the uh, John Gans Penny Center over the last year and to get to um, have you know conversations with a lot of the people on the production side. <laughs> And I think one of the reasons that Sesame does it better than a lot of other places is because they're never satisfied with the product. They always want to see if they can do better. And they're always willing to step back and ask themselves whether or not there's more they can do for a particular demographic, number one. And I think the other thing is they don't shy away from hard things. Their most recent module that they put out is for how to help children with an incarcerated parent. Mm -hmm. Um, through that experience, they're you know working on on a number of other challenges, and I'm sure they'd kill me if I'm sure I'm not supposed to say anything else. But um, where else in children's programming are you seeing things for kids with a parent who's in jail? Um, and so rather than presenting an idealized version of what childhood is supposed to be, they meet kids where they live, and I think that that's a level of respect for parents and for kids and for all that nuance that is so important in being able to move forward with something that is um, relevant and saleable. So. Um, I have a, a follow-up challenge for that, and that's not just the academics. Those are all TV examples. And one of the things that David was talking about was he introduced this as we sort of were, not that we've moved past TV, TV is still very important, but we've got games, we've got interactive media, we've got production timelines that are insanely short compared to what we deal with when we're talking about TV, where not that there's a luxury, but we have a luxury of time. I'm wondering if you guys have examples from a more interactive side. Um, and maybe not Facebook? 
and, and maybe and maybe not preschool. That's another great point um, where this has happened. Because I, I do think we have on the TV preschool side some really really great examples and great people in the room who've had part of that. But I think where we here is the older and moving into faster paced production, whatever that ha medium happens to be. Mm. Arctic monkeys. Mm -hmm. Arctic monkeys. <laughs> Big fan. <laughs> <laughs> that, you, you're raising an important question. Fast. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just what Vicky was saying. Nuance, process. I mean, those things are, are just antithetical. You know, it, it, it's pretty hard to do both. Um, which is why I think the dialogue <laughs> is, is so important. But I wanted to dispute the issue of that it's going to be really, really boring if it's educational at any age. I take a, what is it called, a line in the sand there. I don't think that's true. And I don't think kids have to smell it in that way. And oh, even older kids who are much more savvy than the preschoolers about, oh God, this is trying to teach me something. I think learning is intrinsically exciting. I think we're all curious. We all want to learn something new. We uh, and it's 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 in the mode. So the question that Allison raises of how to do that in a fast way, especially if all those platforms are part of the same um, community of products, um, everybody's got to be at the table. What I have found is that. A lot of people don't, they, they commission you to do something. Like my other story was a white paper. A big white paper that was a very important background piece. But then nobody ever really read it, <laughs> I don't think. So it was written and then that is because to take the time to read it would have meant that there had to be some dialogue, process, integration. And so that's the missing piece. And I think if that were the case, where people got together and sort of thrashed these ideas out a bit, like, you know, there's a line, go slow to get, what is it, go fast to go slow, or go slow to go fast. It's like, you, it's, it's like you have to do something slowly, and then you can go fast. Uh, it's, it, it, it's just, anyway, I'm talking too much. But <laughs> no, no, so academics, what, what's a what's a question or something that you really want to know? Uh, Alison, can I answer your question? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Just as examples, one, you know, blowing Cartoon Network's work, Ben 10 Game Creator, um, and our whole suite of game creator stuff on on our website. Um, really fun game. Um, lots of research about digital literacy and the importance of kids as creators. Mm -hmm. um, is it game store mechanic? No. Um, but I don't know seven children that have actually played through on Game Start again. And I know like millions of kids who will play Ben 10 Game Creator or anything. It's a fun game, um, and I think it paid a lot of attention to the research on the importance of kids as creators and media literacy. Um, argue with, uh, then one that is not ours, but that as a parent I watch with amazement and like wish you would turn it off. My mind. Yeah. I know, but you know what? So I wasn't thrilled that he learned how to make a toilet. But he <laughs> um, it, it's an amazing game about construction. Um, and it's, there's a whole lot going on there. Um, again, I know nothing about the development of the game, but I have to believe that somebody really understands what turns kids on um, and what's important to kids and what they're getting out of it. Those, and I think there are other examples. The challenge is we're not in preschool television um, and we're not PBS. Mm -hmm. It's a different industry. So yes, we do use what you produce, but not in the way you would like us to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think just to echo on what you were saying about Minecraft, one of the great things about that experience is a little bit of a thread, I think, through casual gaming writ large right now, which is that um, that spirit of play is kind so adult or child, there is a, you know, there's a translatability to games like that. Um, and even Game Creator, I think, is a great example of a, you know, really well done and designed experience that offers those creativity tools to anybody who wants to play. One other thing I wanted to mention, the talking about sort of where our inspirations come from.
from the industry side. Um, I think there's, you need to make a distinction between data research and you know um, the, the ability to uh, interpret data with nuance is incredibly important to us. In particular, in the digital world, I have colleagues in the audience who are particularly good at that, um, and I think uh, is something to continually keep. Data can tell us one thing, but without that interpretive, you know, look in, um, we're just looking at numbers and, and trying to react. So, um, any questions on the side for these folks about things you'd like to know? talk about research and we talk about kids and we talk about um, you know age appropriateness and things like that and then you bring up something like Sesame Street. Now when Sesame Street started and I watched it, um, I was the first generation of Sesame Street, um, you know it was made for five and six year olds and today it's done it to you know and kids are on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and so that's one part of this question and then the other part is Technologically, both things seem to be changing. You know, this is slower in terms of the emotional and intellectual, you know, um, development in terms of it's speeding up. Technologically, we're speeding up like this, and kids are moving. You know, it's no longer about the TV; it's about all this stuff, and they're touching it and they want it. How quickly can your research keep up with that, so that what you're researching is actually Useful. I think part of it is not focusing specifically on the new shiny thing. I think that's one of the best things researchers can offer is that any shiny new gadget that comes into a home or a family comes into an existing media environment through which it competes for space. Right? So that home has all the other screens, digital media, non-digital media, Dare I say it? They may, be, they may have books. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're probably using them as doorstops, but they might have some of them in the house. But, but looking at a media environment, this is something that, um, that I've done now in projects over time, is, looking, is having children draw out their home environments and describe what's in it. Not just you know, where everything is placed, but where all the different types of media devices are, and then asking them to pick in each room which one they think is the most important, who uses it the most, with whom, in what language, for what purposes, and so forth. You learn a lot about the way kids see these different things in relation to each other, and while they're grabbing at the shiny new thing, they might not value it in the same way they do something that allows them to engage with an older sibling, or engage with a parent around technology. And the smaller the screens get, the harder it is to use it together. The more it becomes something to pass back, and using it alone. And I think that looking at just the shiny gadget outside of the context of the larger media environment, <coughs> we're, miss, we're gonna miss it because it, it's, it's moving too quickly and it's not the way people live. People don't, don't use a gadget in a vacuum. And they don't just use the gadget. It's the emotional attachment that comes with the gadget. And what's on that device is not all kids need. And kids will prefer television if they feel like television gives them something else. Or at least it'll be in context. So it depends. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, I do, but I do think the bigger environment tells you a lot about how people are really using <clears throat> stuff together. Okay. I think that regardless of what the gadget is and what the technology might be, there does remain for a lot of us the core question. What is it that you are getting from the game experience? What is it that you're getting from the media experience that has relevance to you mm -hmm. in another context? So it doesn't matter what that gadget is. It doesn't matter how the delivery system. What does matter is what are you learning and where else can you use that information that you've gained? And that, that is a core question. That's a holy grail that's going to remain no matter what the technology looks like. So that's, that's how we keep pace. Maybe a cheap shot, but that's... <laughs> <laughs>
what you're saying, though, about the cultural shift is real. That is, there's so much more, so much more uh, uh, grabbing for attention, and so much pressure to, to do it all and have it all. And there's a whole sort of counter to that movement about play, outdoor play, nature deficit research, kids don't get to go outside, you know, and obviously that's not the business that we're in. But um, I think there is a reality there. It's like Nickelodeon, you turn off your TV day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, making some, uh, some kind of accommodation to the understanding that this is a crazy, pressured, constant environment, and then looking at how best to make it work for kids. I, I, I think it's an important question. I do have a question for industry, though. I look at you with awe at how are you able to engage people so effectively, and what is it about the creative process? Is it, you know, it's more than just research. How do you come up with something that's sticky, that's catchy, a tune that people will sing outside the television viewing situation, outside the game situation? That, to me, is absolutely amazing. And a gift. And I, how do you do it? I want to do it in class. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a, it's a real. You know, it, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that um, a project that I'm working on now about bullying prevention um, has been one of the most satisfying projects I've worked on in my career. Um, and I realize the reason why. It's because we're telling kids something they want to know. Um, it emerged from audience research. Kids said, I want to know what to do when I see my friends get picked on. Mm -hmm. um, so we've actually produced some, not the most engaging live action video I've ever worked on. Mm -hmm. um, but because the content was something kids really wanted to know, mm -hmm. it's very good. I think. That's what describes entertainment media. We're giving kids something they want, something that's really satisfying. We're telling great stories. Um, and we're doing it with creative people who really remember what it was like to be a kid and trade on research so they understand the difference between themselves at 10 and today's 10 year old. I think the challenge with educational video once or educational media once you get past sort of a, once you get past five or six um, is that most of the time you're it, it's telling kids something we want them to know mm -hmm. but not something they're innately interested in um, so it really has to be extraordinary for it to work and I think that's the challenge of the whole game for change movement it's games that kids say yeah I'll play in school mm -hmm but I'm not playing at home. Um, so the, the challenge for us is creating things that young people independently choose to spend time with. Because we're not in directed viewing or playing settings. Um, if I can elaborate on that a bit. Um, also in terms of, you know, coming up or finding people that come up with these things that are going to become a SpongeBob and that will engage kids for decades um, with this character. That is, I mean, what that's going to come down to is almost like anti-research um, in some ways, because that's about um, the stories and the characters that Alice was talking about, and it's about the passion behind it and the dedication behind that idea. Um, a lot of it's gut. There, When I was at Cartoon Network, this was before I got there, there was an infamous story about um, Powerpuff Girls and how that got on the air. And they researched, focus group tested the pilot. And kids hated it. Um, one kid said, whoever made that show should be fired. <laughs> <laughs> but Linda Semensky and Mike Lazo, to their credit, saw something there that was original, that was different, there was passion from Craig McCracken who created it, and they said, screw it, we're gonna make 13 of them anyway. And they did and it became a huge hit. Um, or something like SpongeBob, which I know from 
a lot of friends who were at Nickelodeon at the time, it was the ugly stepchild of the two big shows that were launching that year, SpongeBob and Cat Dog. And Cat Dog, <laughs> was really good. Cat Dog was a big, big freaking hit. You know, next huge thing. And there's this weird little thing with the, you know, a sea sponge blowing bubbles that nobody was like, what's that thing? And that was the hit. And again, it was just, there's a, it's untangible, intangible. You can't find it, but when you find it, you just have to catch it no matter what. Every, all your market research and your, you know, um, your, your merchandising research and all this stuff may say, sometimes you just have to take your research and chuck it and go with God. <laughs> but it depends. <laughs> it's very satisfying. It's very satisfying. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question sure. for industry too. Um, if the goal is getting butts in seats, and I, and I love the candidates, um, <laughs> because that's real. I mean, that's the, there's a real bottom line. How do you deal with diversity amongst children at a particular age group, whether that diversity is socioeconomic, language, um, ability, right? Um, how do you deal with diversity, if at all, or is it really kind of targeting a mainstream kid and you hope to catch the edges in that? Is that a question? Does that make sense? No, it totally does. Okay. <laughs> you said it made sense. <laughs> no, it does, and it and it's um, you know you, we are definitely aware of it, and you definitely want to appeal to everyone. And me working for an Emily British company, um, and my shows, you know, I'm often making them for the BBC first, and then I need them to play here. I'm making them for Australia first, and then they need to play here. I'm making them for all over the world, so I need these things to have global appeal and what works here is often doesn't work elsewhere most of the time that's not true but what works elsewhere doesn't work here um, and I need it uh, to work everywhere so so and you and you do want shows to appeal to the biggest number of people possible um, and it's hard and we put stuff in like we, we I'm in production on a preschool show right now and we have you know a, a biracial couple who, you know, are the parents with the daughter, and then they, she goes to, you know, into fantasy land, and we make sure we have, you know, a sh short one and a fat one. I mean, we try, we actually do try to put the Rainbow <laughs> Coalition <laughs> into these shows, because you do get tagged if you don't. People are like, well, why, why is everybody white? You know, why is everybody white and pretty? Why is Friends, you know, a huge primetime hit? You know, everyone's white and pretty, you know, in primetime, and they get, I think, a, um, you know, in the media hit a lot more in prime time than I think in kids. And it's a thing because in kids, we do try. We try really hard. You know, Doc McStuffins on, on Nick Jr. is a great example, so they can have Doc and they can have Sophia. And, Disney Jr. Oh, sorry, sorry, Disney. what did I say? Disney Jr. Sure, what did I say? Oh, sorry. Disney Jr. 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 historic in children's television. Um, it has, as a genre, we have done a much better job than prime time in offering kids that mirror, um, in showing them themselves, no matter who they are, or what they look like, or what their family construction is, with the exception, of course, of lesbian gay families. Um, we don't do that very well. But, um, yeah, and then Martha. Yeah, and then Martha. So I, I do think that, and, and as we look at audience construction, that, that's a constant topic of who are we reaching and are we reaching all the people. Um, so that's something I actually feel pretty good about in terms of the kitchen. And I, I was just going to jump in as I said, oh sorry. No, I was just going to say, I actually think we have a lot, to, a lot of work to do there in games. And that's, that applies to the entirety of the games industry. Um, but games for kids have a great opportunity to kind of represent diverse points of view. Um, and, and let kids to kind of play as their mirror, right? Um, and if those choices aren't readily available, then we've kind of done a disservice, I think. Well, I was actually going to follow up with a, with a games example, and, and a lot of what, what we do is in finding those little wins, right? Um, so you may have something that we know it hit the big audience, but hey, there's this thing that if we did this little tweak, we could expand it. And a great example at a 
former employer not to be named, um, was, you know, we had heard a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence from parents, right, writing in saying that kids playing this game for this particular character was really helping their kids who were on the autism spectrum, which just tons and tons of sort of fan mail for these games. And we sort of looked at it as the research department, and we said, God, is there, some, is there something there? Is there something we can do? Um, and so we went to specialists in the area, and we said, okay, if you were gonna give us recommendations, what would you tell us to do? And they said, well, you know, one of the easiest things is when the child finishes the game, to actually recommend another game, right? And it could be the same character, the same job, but, but my God for the parent, help them get onto another game, but also to help the child, right? To sort of just push them a little bit, keep them in the comfort zone, but just to kind of push them a little bit. And I sat there and I put my industry hat on and my you know, UX hat on and I go, oh God, but that's good for all kids, right? We want to keep moving them around the site, that's great, right? <laughs> And so you know, we were able to go back and say, look, this is a win for everybody. This little tweak that we have that you can message back to these parents who are really engaged, but you know, quite honestly, could also drive your analytics and your ratings. This is our win-win. So I think that's where, and I'm going to close this now, I think that's where <laughs> we actually are hearing some of this, that there are these even little win-wins to continue to build the bridge that may already be there or halfway there or something, or maybe it's closed down because it's the weekends and you know they don't want you to go and whatever it is, right? But I think that there are at least some of these ways that we can make little wins on the way to what will be the big wins moving forward. And I want to thank the panel because you guys are awesome. Over to our quiz master for our last couple of questions, and then to David. Okay, we're going to move to some high-tech research. Uh, there, there's an interesting and growing body of uh, research on what happens with kids in interactive media. Um, so the first question, interactive hotspots, you know, what every interactive uh, producer lives for in ebooks, improves the child's ability to retell the story. You know, so you, Touch here, touch there, and there's some there's something there. So, interactive hotspots help improve a child's ability to retell the story. Never. B. Sometimes. C. Always. Show of hands for never. <coughs> the dark side. Uh, B. Sometimes. Okay. C. Always. Okay. Another. Well constructed question. <laughs> the answer, please. The answer is sometimes. A really interesting piece of research where they looked at the quality of the hotspot and the kids' ability to retell the story. In cases where the hotspot actually helped the story to go a little bit deeper, you know, was on track with the narrative, with the goals of the characters, etc. Guess what? The kids actually did better at retelling that story. When hotspots just were hotspots, you know, lots of singing and dancing, hot animation, lots of music, lots of fireworks, guess what? Cause for confusion and diversion. So, and keep that in mind for this question. All right, this is a study that looked at of the difference in a kid's ability to understand the story, whether it was experienced through an ebook or in print. And here, two of the answers are right. So, A, uh, so this study reports, yay, parents encourage and suggest interactive pathways which lead to greater comprehension. See, honey, let's go this way. Boy. Parents encourage and suggest interactive pathways that lead to greater confusion. No, I need to do this. C, as long as parents read to or with a child, there's no difference in the levels of comprehension between print and ebooks. This is sort of an interesting little piece of data because a lot of us have gotten very excited about this co-viewing thing. We can put any piece of shit on any screen that we want. As long as there's a parent in the room, we're cool. Um, that's not quite the case. There's interesting stuff there too. Or the, 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 the fourth bit of data here, kids comprehension when read a print book is higher than that of a comparable ebook. 
So there are two answers here that are right. Anybody want to go for it? C and D. C. Okay, let's take a look. What's really interesting is, when I have this theory that you, you've all heard about helicopter parents. I think that there's a phenomenon called helipad parents. <laughs> let's do this, let's do this. And, and what, what, uh, what happens is the parent, most parents don't know how to read to a kid. So they are always about reading every freaking word and, and turning the page. So I think there's a lot of, no, honey, let's, no, let's go to the next page. Let's read those words when, in fact, the kid wants to you know, click on the hotspots. So what happens, you know, what happens with the kids' comprehension? It's, you know, it's in this world. And the other interesting thing, also confounded by all of the stuff that is produced over the goal of the book and the story, it just becomes simpler for a kid to focus when mom's reading that story versus they're trying to co-experience a book. Um, so this is the end of the quiz for tonight. I want to leave you with a couple of very important ideas. Uh, probably the most important. Most of these studies, when you, when you read them in consumer media, you will be left with the impression that everything with media that is dark for a child is causal. Uh, games create fat kids. Uh, Ebooks uh, create kids who don't understand. Uh, television, you know, creates kids who are off the wall. And there's a lot of sort of manipulation of ideas through this sort of causal link that we all buy into and keep repeating. At best, this stuff is correlational. And in most of those cases, I just recommend that you take a very careful look at, you know, what that, you know, what, what the population looks like, what variables are being balanced because there's a crazy amount of stuff being reported on. And with that final note, thanks to my graduate school uh, statistics professor who told me, who taught me to really love numbers and statistics, but be very wary of the folks who manipulate them. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to David. Thank you all. This has just been amazing. This has been fantastic. I, think <clears throat> I don't want to let the occasion go without noting an event today. And that is that Bob was nominated for, a, well, his company was nominated for a Kid Screen Award for Strange Hill. Uh, the good news is we're not just going to talk about this. We're going to write about it, too. Um, I have a blog that started a couple weeks ago. The third edition comes out tomorrow in Kid Screen, every other Thursday, that is about exactly these questions of how to build bridges between the academic world and the industry. I'll just tip you off that tomorrow is two economists walk into a bar graph. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're also, also going to think about everything, because I've heard a lot of things today that inspire me with, with other ways that we could bring people together to talk about this. I love the idea that I heard tonight, or that I sort of inferred from, from what I was hearing tonight, that we have a lot of really good slow research, the research that takes a long time, that, that, uh, you know, that really gets in depth into, into the questions. How can we use that in a fast way? How can, how can we allow research to take the time it needs to develop, but also then apply it in ways that work, work in the quick world. And with that, I just want to issue a couple thanks, because uh, that's always necessary. One is to Scott Trailer, who's here in the front row from 360 Kids. How does the world videotaping events like this and getting them online so that it's not just limited to the people in this room or just to, to tonight, you can go back, you can watch it again, you can refer to friends and tell them to watch it. Uh, we'll be uh, promoting soon, CMA and, and Play Collective both will promote as soon as it's up. Scott will promote, so watch for that. Uh, thanks to the CMA for uh, organizing tonight, sponsoring tonight, and uh, letting us work with them. Thanks to an amazing panel that really uh, got into the spirit of this and, and really looked for ways to... And thanks to Allison for moderating. And with that, we have some wine and fruit and cookies over here. Keep the conversation going. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.